and all the things that we have said leading up to the draft are still 100% accurate, right? You are banking completely on Caleb Williams being good and knowing how to use these guys in the right position. And right now, the same defensive problems are the same defensive problems. We're still talking about re-signing Yannick Ngakwe to a team-friendly deal and hoping that we have a second or third defensive end on the team. We're still talking about Jonathan Allen or, uh, you know, all these players that could yeah. potentially be traded for a second round pick. This because... is exactly what we said was going to happen. You're going to go into training camp praying to God that one of your defensive ends doesn't get hurt because you are so paper thin. You are so razor thin at that position that right now, if your offense doesn't carry a little bit in week in year one of Caleb Williams rookie year, you're going to be kind of in trouble because this defense is still a paper tiger. It's, Really, really good at the top, and then depth-wise, it's still not that good. It has – it's still a step ahead of the offense, but that's the problem you get with Roma Dunze and Caleb Williams. You're depending on two rookies to carry your team for the remainder of the season. Maybe it's a long-term plan, maybe it's not. But I know for a fact, if you had like a stud defensive tackle or defensive end drafted with Caleb Williams, we'd be talking about a much more balanced team. Or we'd be talking about which of these rookies is going to do better – are we going to have two rookies of the year? Are we going to have one on offense and one on defense? And this, eh, it would be a funny conversation, but all the things ring true still. However, I'm just kind of uh, reacting to the situation of the market as it stands right now. Right. And that's the whole point you're talking about, which is yeah. these wide receiver contracts are getting out of hand. And I'm, I'm, it makes sense more to take Roma Dunze. I still don't necessarily agree with it as my first choice. There is a plan laid out there. The Chiefs have shown you, and it's a it's a thing of beauty. It really is. You go out there and you draft a guy that should have been drafted in the first round, but he was kicked out of school for this for. I mean, I, I don't even want to get into exactly what, but winds up going to a Division two school, and you wind up drafting this kid in the fifth round, Tyreek Hill, wide receiver, right? So now after Tyreek Hill, after you utilize him and it's time to pay him, what do you do? You draft him away for two first-round picks. You let some other team pay him however much money he wants, and you go off and win a Super Bowl with Rashi Rice and Valdez Scantling. I just I look at some of these situations of like where these wide receivers are getting paid this boatload of money or they're worth so much. Like, How are the Raiders doing with Devontae Adams? Was that worth it? Was that, was that super fun to give up all that draft capital for that guy? it could easily very well wind up biting you in the ass because that position alone, I don't think in general can really be that impactful to carry it. Like you said, there's three of them out there at any given time. You know, And we've said this, we've said this a hundred times. It's so dependent on your quarterback that the point I was trying to make with John Jackson, the third being a, a unrestricted free agent, right? He's unrestricted free agent. He has great chemistry with Caleb Williams. I would almost, I would bet a good amount of money that he's going to make this roster just on the chemistry he already has established with Caleb Williams. And if you're talking about a guy who was drafted ninth overall and they're both making the team as an undrafted free agent just due to chemistry, that kind of just proves our point, right? It's so quarterback dependent. The Roma Dunze pick just kind of still makes sense for the team as it's structured. And it is, it's doing all the right things publicly and media wise. It's still being very, very quarterback friendly by taking a top nine quarterback uh, receiver for a quarterback that you just drafted. I think it's still um, a really smart move for showing support for your team and how you're going to build for the future. But like you said, you know, Tyree kill got, got traded away. That's after Qu Patrick Mahomes had established himself as a dynamite quarterback and kind of was ready to take control of the team. And Hey, I can do this with anybody. It's not just Tyreek. If, Caleb Williams was two years in and he had that reputation. I would say, yeah, for sure. Or at least the Roma Dunze pick would maybe frustrate me a little bit more. Um, as of now, I think it's a good way to set up your quarterback for success. And moving forward, if Caleb Williams is the guy and he makes everybody around him better, I wouldn't be surprised if the Bears never draft, draft a, uh, a wide receiver in the first round again. You know, we've talked about the value of a quarterback. I did kind of just decide to dive in and do some numbers on what the exact value of a quarterback to a team is or what a team is willing to pay a quarterback because essentially the amount of money you pay them is how much they're valued, right? So what I did was I went back through the last 10 years. I took the top 10 quarterback contracts and 
I also took the total cap for that year and I did the math and, and, you know, I have their yearly salary along with the percentage of the total cap that they take up. And I did that for 10 years in a row. So I wanted to kind of share that because it kind of, it does paint a little picture on where the NFL is at and how much they, you know, you hear this all the time with these contracts, like we're talking about now with wide receiver ones, like the numbers are big. Well, the cap, the cap is also growing, but it's the percentage of the cap. You know what I mean? That you're taking up that makes something, you know, either consistent or not. So just looking at it in 2014 here, the total cap was 133 million. Right. And Rogers took up 16.5% of that cap. And you see a good, good chunk of guys in the 15%, a good chunk of guys in the 14%. And I got the average there, 14.6% in 2014. Um, And it's kind of, it's kind of interesting to look at the top paid guy was getting paid 22 million. Now that nowadays that's, that's a steal, right? Yeah. So can I say one thing really funny yeah. observing this list? Because I, I know who the uh, out of curiosity, do you know who the top three paid quarterbacks in the NFL are right now? The highest per year. Salary? I mean, yeah, I have the slide ready. <laughs> oh, okay. This year right. it's Joe Burrow, it's Trevor Lawrence, and it's uh uh Jared Goff. Right. So this year, just by example, oh, right this, now this upcoming year. See, I have the this past year but okay right no for this upcoming season and this list is interesting because super bowl super bowl contender multiple super bowl super bowl winner super bowl winner super bowl winner super bowl winner cutler never even sniffed it bradford never even sniffed it so, so it's pretty then, i think i think it's interesting because back then your top eight guys were either in the super bowl every year or competing for it very, very consistently. So, yeah. Yeah, that that is a good good group of quarterbacks right there. So, yeah, yeah and for sure. so you're spending the money. The money wise. was being – I was going to say, the right. money being spent, spent well. And and that's important to, to recognize as we kind of move forward here. Um, 2015, right? The owners were happy. The average went down, so the amount of money they wound up paying that position. The cap went up. The cap's now one hundred forty three point two eight million, and you have you know Breeze at the top, just like last year, sixteen point five percent. This year, sixteen point six percent goes to the top guy. So fairly consistent. You know, not as many guys in the fifteen percent and fourteen percent. It kind of does a little drop off, but um, still, you see some good names up there, just like you said. A lot of Super Bowl contenders or winners top guys getting paid i right? assume that's alex smith at the bottom ah uh, yes that is alex smith at the yeah. bottom correct yeah and yeah i was surprised to, to really realize how much money kaepernick did make while he was in the nfl mm-hmm. um i don't know why this paid. oh yeah he did so 2016 cap goes up again 155.27 million Average is at 13.8. And personally, throughout this whole thing, I kind of felt like that's really the sweet spot for the average between 13 and 14 percent or like 12 and 14 percent. Even um, mm-hmm. that's usually where that that number bounces around. And this is just the average of the top 10. You know, I'm sure if I dive, dove in and did all of the contracts, it would uh, it would be a little bit different. But I assume it would still kind of move somewhat the same. Um, so, yeah, Eli was the top guy. Uh, you have Tony Romo up there. You have Kirk Cousins up there. Cam Newton up there. Um, so as we get closer to modern day, one thing I've noticed is usually these these annual salaries they're going to balloon at the beginning with you know uh, when they get paid, right? So Eli probably just got paid here. Roethlisberger just got repaid. Matt Ryan got repaid. These are guys that towards the end let's say the second end of their career, these all were problematic contracts in a big way as we inch closer to modern day. Okay. Yeah. That's a very good point. Eli Um, became a a dead weight to his team. Roethlisberger's incredible amount of money became an incredibly heavy dead weight. Matt Ryan became dead weight. Joe Flacco was an absolute problem in terms of financially. Matthew Stafford was not necessarily a problem because he was good enough, but he's right. still, he, his, he actually was about to win one. So right. Matthew but his Stafford salary was, was still generally speaking a problem. His salary being that high was still a problem. And like you said, the average um, 
per year, that 12 to 14 spot, you see the top five, six guys, that list is growing of guys who were above average and, the, and those contracts become problematic. Right. And then you got two MVP seasons coming up from Rogers and look, he's all the way at the, at the bottom. Which is where, you know, uh, Patrick Mahomes is right now. So looking at next year, Mm -hmm. 2017, the cap goes up to 167 million. The average dips down to 12.8. Yeah. You had Flacco making all that money. Look, Carson Palmer getting paid at the back end of his deal. Um, Kirk Cousins making a ton of money. Yeah, Matt Ryan. Ryan Tannehill gets up there. So uh, then in 2018, 177.2 million. Average shoots up a little bit to 14.3. And Jimmy Garoppolo took a $37 million cap hit that year. Yikes. Um, Carr is up there. Flacco's up there. Wait, Jimmy Garoppolo on which team? I believe that was 49ers. Ah, right, right, right. I think I thought of Jimmy Garoppolo as a Raider. Yeah. Yeah, no, that was probably the year he got paid. Yep. So huge problem. Huge problem. Yep. And then Carr was a massive problem. Oh, yeah, exactly. Carr was up there too. So then in tw- we move on to 2019. And cap goes up again, 188 million. And yeah, yeah, I mean, so these numbers are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Like you can see now, now we're paying a quarterback 30 million, but it's still 16.3 percent. It's still that same percentage we saw five years back, where that that amount of cap space is. Some teams out there are willing to throw that at a quarterback, right? And 2020 cap goes up. 198 million and you know Dak Prescott getting paid uh Jared Goff getting money but yeah like you still have and this is interesting this is the only time that Brady pops up on this list and it's his first year in Tampa the year he was told to go get his money essentially other than that throughout this whole tenure thing Brady never once financially crippled his team not once you know he was always not a top 10 paid quarterback and he's doing just fine. Right. So uh, the interesting thing is that Tannehill makes this list again. Hmm. Right. And then 2021, the cap actually goes down and that's due to the COVID year. Right. So then in 2022, Tannehill's the top paid guy. Mahomes is up there very well, deservingly. So we got Kirk cousins, Jared Goff, Aaron Rodgers, Carson Wentz, um, got Lamar Jackson, Dak Prescott, Carr again, and Sam Darnold, right? And the average is 13.1%. And then, so these last two years here, I thought, are very interesting. So then in 2023, Mahomes is the top t- paid guy, $37 million, But look, it's still 16.5% of the total cap. Just like we started you know, in, in 2014, it's the same. So 37 million, sure. But since the total cap now is 224 million, um, this average actually went down a lot. Look, a lot of these guys are getting paid under 10%, which is something that wasn't really happening. But then in 2024, you have this, Whoa. which is just, you know, so the cap went up. But, like, look at that ridiculous cap hit for Watson the ridiculous cap hit for Dak Prescott two guys at the top that haven't proven anything taking up that much percent of their team's money. Kyler Murray's up there. Daniel Jones is up there as a cap hit. So one thing we said at the beginning was, well, this is very well managed money because the top eight of 10 guys are all either appearing in Super Bowls or have won a Super Bowl. Whereas in this list, you kind of look at it, and out of the top five guys, you only have Stafford. That's one. Then you have, you know, Mahomes, Jackson, Allen, Burrow, Goff. And, I mean, I guess I can understand all those, but it's like – but Daniel Jones, Kyler Murray, Dak Prescott, and Deshaun Watson are, have robbed their teams, essentially. You know what I mean? And it's it's kind of crazy. So, yeah, when you see it, 
drawn out as a graph, it just kind of spikes in this last year. So I'm actually really interested to do this next year and see kind of if that levels off at all or if these teams are just going to continue to spend that kind of money on on these quarterbacks. And like I said, when looking at the value, when you're assessing that much cap to one player, you're really leaning on them. And then the guy like Deshaun Watson just goes off and gets hurt. Well, I mean, this is this supports really what we always talk about, though, right? Is It's not about what you're paying a guy. It's not our money. We don't care at all. It's about the construction of your roster. It's about allocated allocation of resources and how can you distribute that money to make your team better. Deshaun Watson and Dak Prescott on their own are not making their teams better. If anything, their, their team, their individual team, is looking, how can we get rid of this guy's contract so that we can advantageously move on and right, like move on past this player get a new quarterback, but make it more advantageous towards team building. And I think the Browns are a great example. The Cowboys, obviously, with Jerry Jones and how he's doing business right now, not paying any of his players. C.D. Lamb doesn't have a contract extension. Micah Parsons doesn't have a contract extension. Dak Prescott doesn't have one. So they're looking to move on. How they're going to move on, who knows? Maybe it's free agency. Maybe it's through a trade. But I think when you allocate so many resources towards one position, it never – never seems to pay off those, the lists that you provided it never really the top end guys rarely, I'm not going to say never, but I think they hardly paid off. And usually when you gave us the average per year, teams that had the player below the average were being more successful. So I think moving forward, that's like something good that the bears need to pay attention to not overpaying people. And I think that's what Ryan Poles has been doing it, which is I think brilliant. And, a good way to keep your team relevant. Well, I mean, we looked at a guy like Roquan Smith. And we right. said, you cannot do that. Like, I'm sorry. Let, you know, let the Ravens go pay him. That's fine. Because to allocate that amount of money towards one position, a linebacker, it's, it really cripples you in other places and you need the depth. It's hard to stay healthy and you need to be able to pay the depth, you know? So, um, fine. Financial allocation is huge, and I think a lot of people, you know, don't understand. It's like the second half of the game, it really is. I always imagine it kind of like a like a poker match, man. Right? At, at any point, you can go all in, but guess what? If you don't win, you know, you kind of you could bust out. That's why even what the Rams did several years ago with trading away all their draft picks and everything like that, it's like wow, you're you're pushing your chips all in, and good for them. They were able to win. But if they didn't beat Cincinnati in that Super Bowl, oh man, they would have maybe highly regretted a lot of those choices, you know. So yeah, they'd be in big trouble as a franchise, and that's why, as a Bears fan moving forward, I think this is that's this, this is why we are all so excited about the future of the franchise moving forward is that it's just being managed well, more than anything else right now. So regardless of how you feel about each individual player or anything like that. Um, it's being managed well, and I, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but when Trevor Lawrence got paid, all I could think was at the very least, Justin Fields with an extension would have been worth 40 to $45 million at the minimum. Oh, and if, yeah. we're being, yep. if we're being honest, 40 to $45 million per year. You're looking at a Daniel Jones deal. I think you have to, right? And so what you do know what costs $45 million? Montez Sweat and Jalen Johnson. Right, and so – that's a fact. It's not a. It's not an arguable fact. Montez yeah. Sweat is twenty two million dollars. Jalen Johnson's about nineteen and a half. If you are paying forty million dollars next year to Justin Fields on a contract extension because you like the guy and he's a nice teammate, you're losing your two key defensive players. And if your team, if your quarterback isn't ready to take over by then and carry that team, I feel about <laughs> Caleb Williams. I said, it's the smart, logical, business savvy move to make. Whether or not you like Justin Fields or you hate Caleb Williams. If you can objectively look at the situation and just money and how to manage a team and general managing and roster allocation, resource allocation, roster bu- building, it was the smartest move they could have done. They have the quarterback position locked down for five years at minimum at a team friendly salary. And they got two of their best defensive players re signed for the same amount of time. It's, yeah. it's a no brainer. Otherwise, you would have been stuck in a situation where now you passed up two first overall picks to keep Justin Fields 
And if you think that he's not going to demand some kind of money and want to get paid, I mean, you literally passed up two first overall picks to keep me. Why wouldn't you pay me? It's it's that easy. And he, he would have all the leverage. You know, the Bears would have. What are you supposed really to do? 